Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 20th William Gould Dow Distinguished Lecture. I'm Michael Wellman, Chair of Computer Science and Engineering, and I'm pleased to see that so many of you are here uh, to uh, join us for this today. Uh, our Dow lecturer is Sanjeev Arora, the Charles C. Fitzmaurice Professor of Computer Science at Princeton University and director of a cross-disciplinary entity called Princeton Language and Intelligence. Professor Aurora is a renowned theoretical computer scientist and we will hear today has lately focused on questions fundamental to understanding artificial intelligence. The Dow Distinguished Lectureship is the highest external honor bestowed by the EECS department and it enables us to bring extremely prominent and accomplished individuals such as Professor Aurora to our campus. The lectureship was established by donations from students and friends of William Gould Dow, a former faculty member and chair of what was then the Department of Electrical Engineering. Professor Dow was a scientist, educator, and inventor. During his 38 active years at Michigan, from 1926 to 1964, he was largely responsible for creating and organizing at least 13 laboratories and research units. He introduced a number of innovative areas of study into the curriculum, including vacuum tubes, nuclear theory, solid state devices, and computer engineering. I am personally quite honored to welcome Sanjeev Arora as our Dow lecturer. I would now like to ask Wei Hu, Assistant Professor of Computer Science and Engineering, to step forward and formally introduce Professor Arora. All right, uh, hello everyone. It's my great pleasure to formally introduce Sanjeev Arora. And as Mike mentioned, he's a uh, uh, Charles Fitzmaurice Professor of Computer Science at Princeton University and also the director of the Princeton Language and Intelligence Initiative. And Sanjeev is very well known for several breakthrough results in theoretical computer science, such as probabilistic checkable proofs and um, approximation algorithms for NP-hard problems and, and many more. And um, in the past decade, he has been focusing on the theory of machine learning, in particular deep learning. And um, he has been running a very active group at Princeton working on this area, uh, which I was fortunate enough to be part of for my PhD. And uh, uh, of course, he has also received a uh, uh, a large number of prominent awards. So these include um, the ACM Doctoral Dissertation Award in 1995, Packard Fellowship 1997, Simons Investigator Award in 2012, Girdle Prize twice in 2001 and 2010, Fulkerson Prize in 2012, and uh, ACM Prize in Computing in 2011. And Sanjeev is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, as well as the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And he's also a fellow of the ACM. So uh, it's with great pleasure that I welcome Sanjeev to tell us about uh, skills in large language models. Let's welcome. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mike and Wei. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, amazing faculty and great atmosphere. By the way, there are still a few seats over here if you'd like to filter and feel free. Um, also here. Um, so yeah, this, uh, um, of course, language models need no introduction, uh, but here what we'll try to do is give some mathematical and conceptual understanding of how they get uh, complex skills. And uh, I'll start with something that you all know. Of course, uh, uh, it's, uh, today is actually the uh, one year anniversary of ChatGPT. Sorry, yesterday was the one year anniversary of ChatGPT. That's when everybody learned about it. And uh, maybe you see, you tune into this story at some point in this uh, 10 years preceding it. There was AlexNet, and here the numbers correspond to a number of uh, parameters. And then there were these, uh, the early language models, which were already very shockingly good, uh, about twice as large. GPT-3 was like more than a thousand times larger, and it was hugely better. And then these were even larger. And GPT-4, nobody knows, but probably is even bigger than that. Uh, and of course, uh, 
uh, GPT-4 is uh, believed to have uh, uh, passed the Turing test by many people. Um, and so some quick numbers. Uh, $1 billion is the remote, remote compute budget for one model. They're so large. Uh, zero is the number of independent experts outside these handful of companies who know the code, data set, training method, et cetera. And then about 10 million is the max compute budget. I mean, until a few months ago, it was like 2 million or something uh, of any US academic research group. But now Harvard and Princeton have announced our GPUs haven't quite arrived yet, but soon. Uh, and so there's uh, this talk uh, uh, of great interest to the world and society, you know, that AI is, uh, uh, is controlled by a small number of firms, although lately there's uh, some promising signs in the open domain. Yeah, that was just to set the background, which I think most of you know. Um, the other thing that uh, people, uh, that will be directly relevant is this whole debate about is the thing intelligent? And even many experts find it hard to believe that out of what's essentially glorified autocomplete, you would get intelligence, right? Because uh, as you know, that this is all they do, that there is a piece of text, you input it into the model, and you get a probability distribution on the next words. So that's like autocomplete. And the quality score of the model uh, involves checking, uh, this is what it boils down to. Basically, it's average predictive value on real text. So like when you estimate the probability is 0.1, one tenth of the time it's correct, okay? Roughly that's what it means. Uh, we'll see more details later. And then training, of course, is gradient descent. You update the model's inner parameters to improve on this quality score. So very simple idea. And uh, so, yeah, this debate about whether it's even um, intelligent, you know, yeah, there was this famous paper which referred to language models as stochastic parrots. And maybe in 2020, the models were kind of like that. But today, you know, uh, not clear. So we'll return to that issue. But still, the debates still continue among leading researchers in AI whether these models are intelligent. Including these two experts, uh, Jeff Hinton and Andrew Ng, uh, they posted this nice interview uh, hosted by Andrew, uh, where, um, I mean, Hinton obviously is uh, much more interested in, uh, in you know, potential dangers of AI. And at one point, at this uh, point in the video, he asks, you know, one important thing to, to, uh, for experts to agree upon, you know, before the public can understand it, is our chatbots actually understanding this? You know, because Hinton seems to think they do, and um, and this is very relevant for this whole discussion of AI alignment and safety. So again, this is just background, which most of you know. So now um, we want to understand. So if we if we can have that debate, even in order to have that debate, we should at least understand what we're talking about. You know, what are skills? What are complex behaviors, etc.? And how do they emerge? So as already indicated, the driver of AI, it seems, has been that bigger is better. And so let's see what that means. And one caveat here is that bigger seems to be necessary but not sufficient. You know, there are entities who just put a bunch of money together uh, to train models, and they're not so good okay, of that scale. So you do need some good engineering, good science. <laughs> Okay, so bigger is, bigger is better. What, what do people mean by that? So um, a lot of people in AI, uh, well, AI draws on people from all kinds of fields. Many are, are physicists. And so the first thing they thought about was scaling laws to just understand how things scale. And uh, this was an uh, open AI paper uh, where they found that this error in next word prediction on new text, new meaning unseen, not training text, uh, scales as something like this. So this is called cross entropy, which formally is just the sum over the words uh, in the corpus of log of one over the probability that the model assigns to the next word that it hasn't seen, given the previous words. And it has this kind of behavior. This, is, uh, this actual form is from a later paper from DeepMind, the Chinchilla scaling law. So look at this. It's, there's a constant term. And then there is this term which 
uh, decreases with n, the number of parameters, and data set size, so polynomially. So as you make this larger, usually you make both of these larger in tandem. You increase the size, you increase the data set size. And uh, then you find that uh, you know, the, the prediction is getting better, okay, the quality of predictions. All right, so this uh, constant term, it, it turns out, mathematically corresponds to the entropy of, of language. So even if you give humans the prediction task, uh, there'll be a range of opinions of what the next word is, and you know, based on that, you derive a probability distribution and the entropy of that. And then this is uh, mathematically is kind of like you know you don't need to understand this, but those of you who know about KL divergence between distributions, it's like the KL divergence of human with respect to the model. And that, if you put in you know the numbers n these days, which are in the trillions, you get something like you know, 0 0.05. Okay, for GPT-3, it was about 0 0.05. Okay, that number. So it's very small, right? 3 4% of the entropy. And one of the things that uh, people found mysterious uh, is that, you know, so basically when you're scaling up, you're reducing this lower order term. Why the heck should that make a huge difference? So we'll return to that. So that's just... Uh, improvement in the capability that you're training on, right? Predicting the next word. But it was found that there were these range of tasks that people in natural language processing and other fields had studied for decades. And uh, slowly, uh, and suddenly it was found that when you increase the model to a certain size, suddenly these tasks start becoming solvable. And solvable in many cases without any training, just from training on text, Next word prediction, voila, it can do truthful QA or you know multitasking, whatever. And uh, this emer this competence for many tasks actually emerged about the same scale. The x-axis here is flops, uh, floating point operations, but it could you could also put other things on the x-axis, number of parameters, data set size. X-axis is on a log scale anyway, so those things don't matter. Um, yeah, so that was, that was termed emergence. So uh, a peek ahead, you know, another uh, thing, of course, you've all uh, interacted with ChatGPT, so like skill mix evaluation. This is an evaluation that I'll talk about. This is from our group. So you start with N skills. These are language skills like modus ponens, simple reasoning, red herring, you know, red herring in an argument, spatial reasoning. Uh, self-serving bias, these are, you know, language skills, theory of mind skills, okay. topics, you know, sewing, building, beekeeping, etc. And you generate a, uh, randomly select some number of skills, some number of topics, is one topic, I'm sorry, and you, and you ask the model, generate a short text about sewing that exhibits these skills, okay, spatial reasoning, mm -hmm. these things, okay, so, the 7 billion model, Lama tool chat from Meta, uh, which is, uh, th this family of models is, uh, is a, a fantastic uh, uh, tool for research because these are open models. So, you know, it says something, it's okay, but not great. Uh, the 70 billion model is noticeably better, okay? So it at least tries to address, you know, it has a metaphor in there, like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Um, and then GPT-4, you know, addresses all the, all the requirements and it's much more interesting. Um, so you can see, you know, just interacting with it, you know, so those of us who think about it all the time, you know, we, we have our pet ways of testing. You know, new model comes out, we give it these things and see what it says. Right, so clearly things getting better. So why is bigger better? That's the theory we, we're trying to create. Okay, and that's this paper with Anirudh Goyal of DeepMind, and this was done at DeepMind when I was on sabbatical there. Theory for emergence of complex skills. So the point of view here is deep learning, language models, these are very hard to understand. What can we, what kind of conceptual understanding can we derive now? And that can be somewhat regress. And it should make some kind of predictions that uh, that should stand up. Okay, so 
<laughs> why do I say what kind of uh, understanding is possible right now? So maybe many of you know that deep learning is kind of a black box. <laughs> so we lack understanding. I see. I should move it like this. Maybe. So, so as uh, we mentioned in my group, we've been trying to develop understanding of uh, what happens to deep necessary training. And we have some rudimentary understanding, but it's still very, as I said, rudimentary. So then, you know, what's the definition of the problem? You know, what are skills? What is, com what is competence on tasks? You know, there were all these, there at this point, dozens, if not hundreds, of language tasks that we know models are good at. So what, is, what are these tasks what, mathematically, right, if you want to say something mathematically? And uh, there are decades of uh, uh, the decades of research on trying to formalize what's language, language tasks, etc., and mathematical formaliza formalizations. But they are fairly rigid. Okay, They're, nobody thinks that that those mathematical frameworks are actually describing language. Okay, there's some very rough approximation. Then. Even if I have a formalization of skill, then what is combination of skills? That also is not well defined. Um, and how do you argue, you know, given that we don't know what's going on in deep, deep nets at any good mathematical level, how do you argue that all these ill-defined tasks somehow emerge roughly in tandem, right? And uh, how is this related to next word prediction? Uh, why do combinations of skills emerge? Right, that we saw the example that the larger model could really combine skills flexibly on demand. Um, and here's another intriguing phenomenon. Like, if I start combining K skills, the number of combinations is number of skills to the power K. It's Ks like that. And we all know how like, exponentials work. So this means that even for like K equals 5, you know, like even if the number of skills is in the, let's say, a thousand, and it's certainly much more than that. Um, fifth power of something starts getting to be really large and certainly bigger than the training corpus. So you would not see all possible combinations. So somehow you have it's a meta skill that you learn. And this is an old debate that uh, uh, Noam Chomsky started in the 50s, you know, pointing out that humans somehow learn language without actually having seen all possible combinations. There's, there's a poverty of stimulus. Somehow we learn language, and we have all these flexible ways of using language. But we don't see all those, all those examples. So it's somewhat related to that. So now I'll start to develop this theoretical framework and how to think about this. So the first thing to realize is that this autocomplete, the next word prediction, it's actually more powerful than it looks. Okay, and the experts understand this, but somehow maybe people who haven't thought about it are mystified by it initially. And there's a very famous old example by Vinograd, who was trying to write a PhD thesis on language, uh, computers understanding language back in 1970, and he realized it was very hard. And here was his example, or one of his many examples. And these are called Vinograd schema. The city councilman refused to demonstrate as a permit because they feared violence. Now here I have um, marked uh, day right, in, in a different color. And the reason is that day is actually ambiguous here. It could refer to the city councilman or the demonstrators. And so to, to uh, clarify this, you can insert what's called a, a closed prompt, okay, a multiple choice question. Who feared violence? Okay, and the model can be asked to provide the answer, A or B. So that's the next word prediction, A or B. And until four or five years ago, the models were clueless, 50-50. But now they all ace this, this kinds of tests. Okay, so this is called the closed question. So uh, for many language tasks, not all, but quite a large fraction of them, uh, you can test understanding or uh, ability to do the task by, by this multiple choice questions. So we'll, we'll return to these. Uh, and the point here is that 
this uh, next word prediction, you remember there was a log there, so that's formally the cross entropy. There's a big difference between 50-50 guess, you know, like you're 50-50 between two answers, and 100% correct, or close to 100%. Because the cross entropy for, for perfect prediction is log one, which is zero. And log two is very large in comparison. Everything is larger than zero. So, uh, so if you reduce this uncertainty for next word prediction, get better at next word prediction, it's going to force the model to also go from this log two to log one, because that's what the human is. And if you go to log one and you understand that this was this was a city councilman, you have to understand you know everything about the world around this, who are city councilmen, who are demonstrators, who causes violence, you know all of these things, who had what's a permit, etc. So just to answer that one question, seemingly simple disambiguation of day, you need to understand a lot about the world. And that's tested by this question. Okay. All right, so next word prediction is a little bit more complicated. And, and you can easily generalize to other settings and realize that by injecting simple questions into text, you can really force the model and test it to, to uh, you know, test it on its all kinds of understanding, right? Whatever is being talked about. All right, so complex skills. What are complex skills? And this is what we analyzed it. It's ability to combine more basic skills in solving a new task. Now, that seems like a recursive definition. What are basic skills? So we'll return to that. But um, anyway, so it's a tuple. So we already saw an example of this. So yeah, write a single piece of text with two sentences on the topic sushi, demonstrating these skills. And, uh, and you know, GPT-4, again, ace that. Uh, and uh, just, this is just looking ahead. Uh, it, we did this evaluation, and I'll talk about it at the end. Uh, the small model, so this was, by the way, a prediction of the theory, you know, that this kind of thing will emerge. And actually, it, it was tested only more recently. Yeah, small models can only combine a small number of skills, and medium a little bit more. Grass students, you know, three, four. Uh, four, you know, it starts getting to be tough, you know, like takes 10 minutes. Uh, and then large can do like that. Okay, yes. Uh, yeah. How does the skill mixing evaluation work there? It's just what I showed, you know, there's a list of skills and a list of topics and pick case skills. And, okay, but like, yeah. I guess I can really test like if the, the piece of text that it generates actually like, uh, uses all those skills. Oh, we use GPT-4. Auto oh, okay. and, and human spot checking. Okay. Yeah, I'll get to the details. Okay, so here's a cast of characters for our theory. So now we're going to talk about skills and complex skills and how they emerge. So normally the paradigm of language models is that uh, you're modeling the distribution of language, that humans have a certain distribution and that the model is learning to mimic that. Uh, we want to move away from that. Uh, so we are going to think of uh, language or the training or the corpus as pieces of text of a certain size. And uh, you are still ha going to have these kinds of you know prediction tasks within the piece of text, but uh, you know it's just pieces of text. And now these pieces of text have a certain probability. Okay, so text T has probability mu T. And uh, we're going to assume that there are some latent skills in text. What they are, we don't care, okay? It's a mathematical theory. There exist some skills, basic skills. Okay. And these could be linguistic, logic, science, common sense, you name it. And these also have a probability, each of them. Now, for every piece of text, there's a set of skills that are needed to understand that piece of text. So think of that as edges in a graph. Skills on one side, pieces of text on the other. The number of pieces of text is very, very large. Uh, it won't fit in all the computers of the world. But anyway, it's, uh, it's a mathematical framework. And so there are these edges that indicate which skills are needed for which piece of text. And now we are assuming that to test understanding of T, nature has added close prompts to it. 
via some unknown process. So some very wise entity has added those things. Now I want to emphasize one thing. What are we looking at? These pieces of text are not the training pieces of text. These are for, te for testing the model. So what we're looking at here is test, what happens at test time. Why can we get to test time and forget about training? It's because we're going to assume the scaling laws. So the scaling laws I showed you, you know that as the model gets larger, it gets better at printing the next word. We're going to assume that as a law of nature, kind of like second law of thermodynamics. Once you assume that, it tells you how well the model predicts the missing words or answers to closed prompts in the, in the test data. So that's, so we are, this is what we're looking at here is the test data, not the training data. Training is done, it followed the scaling laws, so I can directly go to test data and reason about what's going on there. Any questions? Yes. So, so I just like to reiterate that you're not making, um, you're not trying to characterize like the popular distribution of like any of the. Like, it's given by nature. Yes. <coughs> yes. So it's an arbitrary distribution. The theory is that can't assume what this distribution is, and yeah. Okay. So by the way, what we're also trying to do here. Uh, indirectly is to change the way people think about language models. That, uh, you know, that there's, there are these latent skills, there are these pieces of text, and these pieces of text, you know, right now we're thinking of natural text, but they could be synthetic. In future, the models may have images, whatever. So there could be other types of data here. Yes? Uh, there's a joint distribution, yeah. But each piece of text has a probability. No, but across pieces of text. We assume nothing. Yeah. Yeah, very good question. So, yeah, across, you know, each piece of text has a probability. And so the sum of these has to be one. That's the only thing we assume. Yeah. So you can see, yeah, we're, we're trying to assume as little as possible. Yeah. Um, sorry, I, I guess I'm just a bit hazy. Uh, I guess the big picture is you want to show that um, new combinations of skills can be like learned. Yeah, so we'll get to that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, combinations I haven't gone to. So now statistical task associated with each skill S. So a skill is just a node in, uh, uh, you know, at the, uh, at the, you know, in this layer. So th there's a skill here. Now, you know, it, it has edges to various pieces of text. So the statistical task associated with the skill is roughly, you know, you have to renormalize the properties and so on, but pick a random text piece adjacent to S and answer its close points. OK? So that's a statistical task. So now, you know, scale, which seemed like this very nebulous thing, once you have this framework of graph theory, is just a very simple thing that you pick, uh, what is the task? You pick a node here, an arbitrary node. It's associated with, each node has a task associated with it. And then randomly pick a text piece adjacent to it and answer its close points. OK? Statistical task, right? There's a distribution of text pieces. And competence is just success rate. So now that we've defined statistical task for individual skill, you can also define it for tuples of skills. So if you have a skill pair, you pick a random text piece adjacent to both S1 and S2 and answer its close points. Okay, so again, you have to renormalize probabilities so that this is a probability. And the competence is again success rate. So these are complex skills. And you can define it for triples, quadruples, et cetera. Yes? yes. Again, there, my question of the joint distribution comes in. Because if I have two texts and I want to ask the same thing, I could get a different answer or like it was not. You're only going to pick one piece of text, not two. Okay. Yeah. One piece of text and asking for the same skill. No, you're going to pick, no, the, the test is just, the, the statistical uh, task is to pick one piece of text. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, you can see we have to, given all that's unknown, we have to like thread a path through to, with minimal assumptions uh, that still gives you something. So even here it's actually, yeah, people are surprised there's anything that you can say. All right, so illustration, just to uh, illustrate the notions I've introduced. 
suppose nature produced this text using a five tuple of skills. So to understand this and to answer this, you have to un have some five tuple of skills. Then this piece of text appears in the distribution for or in the statistical task for. Uh, five statistical tasks corresponding to individual skills, those five skills. Five choose two statistical tasks corresponding to pairs of skills. Right? There are five skills, pairs of skills, there are five choose two. Five choose three statistical tasks corresponding to triples of skills, etc. OK? So there's a huge profusion of complex skills, right? All k tuples. We've commented on this before. All right. So that was the framework. Now we have to assume something, right? So the gentleman there was perplexed. Nothing has assumed so far. What, what are we doing here? So you need something. So the, that's a mixing assumption. So when nature, uh, you know, how does nature produce pieces of text? So it picks a k tuple of skills iid, meaning with replacement from this measure. Uh, not iid, but yeah, with replacement. Uh, independent draws with replacement, sorry, not in the identical. Uh, and uses an unknown process to convert it into a text piece with an associated probability matrix. Okay, so this is a key assumption that these pieces of text, you know, they, they were relying on skills. And what this is saying is that that graph is a random bipartite graph, random from the side of the text. So the piece of text was generated using a random k-tuple of skills. And the closed sufficient assumption, and this can be relaxed in some ways, but for now, I'll just assume that. Average er error in the closed forms tracks the excess cost entropy. So you know what we were talking about you know, the error in next word prediction, it, it corresponds to error in answering the closed prompts and or the closed questions. And uh, that can be made a little bit more rigorous, but for now, just assume that. Okay, that the, these uh, multiple choice questions have squeezed out all of the model's confusion about you know, next word prediction. Okay. So that was the framework. Now, the key technical part, why emergence? Like competence on many skills emerges roughly together, and also competence on many skill tuples. And just to give away the, buzz, uh, the punchline here, remember the graph is a random bipartite graph. And that has very strong mathematical properties. That's where it will come from. You know, this synchronized emergence and this surprising emergence of k-tuples. OK, so yeah. So again, emphasizing. The key part here is that these, each piece of text was generated by picking k skills randomly from the distribution of skills. So here's a key calculation for understanding how competence emerges on tuples of skills or, or individual skills. So let's say we have a certain model. And you know it has a certain error in the next word prediction, which by our assumption corresponds to error in predicting answers to the multiple <coughs> choice questions. And x denotes a piece of text where some error appears. So our general framework is that whenever even one error appears in a text piece, you didn't understand it. There's no notion of partial understanding. You made one error, too bad. You, you get zero points. OK, so in order to get full points for a piece of text, you have to answer all the questions exactly correctly. And you know, the exactly correctly, there is some threshold, excess cross entropy. But OK, that's the only uh, thing we assume. OK, so now that's where all the errors are happening. So now there are these tasks associated with skills and skill tuples. So whenever a, a skill is adjacent to a lot of these pieces of text where errors are happening, you haven't got competence on it. Now, here's what scaling does. Remember, we are going to assume scaling law, kind of like second law of thermodynamics. And this is what we're looking at, the, 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 the test, performance on test data. So scaling up the model 10x reduces this prediction rate, you know, this error in the closed questions by a factor of two, according to the scaling law. Roughly, that's what comes out of the scaling law. So what that means is that half of these x's go away. Okay? So x's correspond to where there was a mistake. You scale up the model, half the x's go away. Okay? 
So now you have only half as many x's. Right. So theta is that fraction of x pieces labeled there. So now the question is, as we do, up this, do the scaling and this theta gets smaller and smaller, how does competence on skills and, mix, and uh, tuples of skills emerge? Okay. So here, what we use is random graph theory. So remember, I told you that text pieces are generated by taking random tuples of skills. So that means that this graph is random. So the outgoing edges from each of the text pieces is a random set of k down here. And uh, now y is a set of text pieces with errors, so the x's, and that is a certain size, theta n. Now the point is, we don't know anything about gradient descent or anything, uh, like where the errors are, anything. So this set is an arbitrary set. Yes? Are you considering also disconnected graphs? Like, I noticed that 3 is not connected to anything. Yeah, this was just, uh, I mean, this is a small graph. Yeah, it's, it could be disconnected, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like, is it necessary? No, 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 no. It has nothing to do with it. Yeah. It's just uh, <laughs> I asked it to give me a random bite uh, graph. And, and, yeah. OK. Um, all right. So competence on a scale, right, uh, is the fraction of its edges that do not go into this place where the errors are. So now it becomes a graph theoretic question. You know, how many edges do you, how many nodes are there with a certain fraction of edges? So, so this is a kind of theorem you can prove with just Simple random graph theory. So, you know, people who've done any random graph theory, like day one, the probabilistic method, you know, expectation argument, you can uh, prove these kinds of results. Uh, that for at least one minus alpha fraction of the edges, at most beta theta fraction of the edges go to, sorry, at least one minus epsilon fraction of the skills, at most beta theta fraction of the edges go to y, where, you know, alpha beta theta k satisfy this equation, where h is the entropy function. So I won't prove this here. Uh, but for those of you who know the probabilistic method, uh, you know, uh, here. The proof idea is to just uh, use a probabilistic method to show this holds for all y of certain size. OK, because y is arbitrary. We can't uh, assume anything about what y it is. So we have to argue for all y's. And the probabilistic method allows you to do that. OK? Any questions? Yes. Like, so I was wondering about the data generating process that you're focusing on over here. Like, for example, you're saying theta times n1. And n1 in this situation, of course, can't be small. But like when we talk about real language, like it's huge. No, no, it is huge. This is an asymptotic statement. Oh. It won't hold for n1 equals 10. Yeah, yeah. No, this is with n1. Yeah. No, that was just the yeah, picture. Yeah. Uh, so this is called the emergence curve. OK, so now when you plot these curves, you basically get the kinds of behaviors. OK. So by the way, this theory you know, is giving you some minimum guaranteed uh, competence on the skills. You know, in real life, it could be better. You know, maybe this, this places where the errors are special. OK, this holds for any, place, any distribution of errors, arbitrary. So this, in real life, could be better than this. But just from the random graph theory, this follows. Now, what about complex skills? Remember, complex skills correspond to the tuples of basic skills. So the tuple is the basic skills with the nodes in the graph at the bottom. Tuples are k tuples of those nodes. And the basic emergence law that happens, and this appears to be new. It uses a tensorization argument. I hadn't seen it before. Uh, if competence or anything like it before is what I mean. Uh, if competence on k prime tuples is currently described by some curve, then after 10x scaling of the model, the same curve holds for competence on 2k prime tuples. OK? So that's the meta theorem. Uh, so what that means is, so uh, I mean, just a quick idea of what's going on here. So lower is better here. So this is in terms of error. So the lower means better, lower error. So at any time, you know, for single skills, there's a certain competence. For pairs of skills, you'd have worse competence. For quadruples of skills, you'll have even worse co uh, competence, according to that calculation. And when you scale up the model by 10x, you improve theta by a factor of 2, and all of these shift down. So pairs goes down to where the 
single skills are, quadruple goes down to zero. Yeah, so. That's what this theorem is saying. So in other words, if you scale, uh, roughly speaking, if you scale up the model by a factor of 10, so you go from 7 billion model to 70 billion model to 700 billion model, which is roughly the range we're talking about these days, you'll see that the k will double. OK? That's a rough prediction. And OK. And here, this addresses. So as we argued before, the number of k prime tuples is just too large for any reasonable size of the set of skills. But it emerges. And it follows from just these two assumptions that you know, pieces of text are using a random subset of skills and, um, and the scaling law. That's it. OK, so it's actually implying that, yes, you learn to go be good at k prime tuples of skills, even though you may never have seen it in the training data. Which leads us to skill mix evaluation. So we, we did this, uh, this theory, and uh, then you know, informally you type into chatbots, and it seems you know, that larger models do have better ability to combine skills. But with uh, students, and then these three, the two DeepMind colleagues, Jonah Brown-Cohen and Anirudh Goyal, we did this evaluation. Um, OK. So let me start by saying, yes? One quick question about the pre previous part. So like, one core assumption I just said is like, the skills are uh, randomly selected in the, yeah. in the generating yeah. process. Like, as you know, points for improvement, would you argue, like, in real life, of course, we won't see all the skills being randomly sampled. Some skills will be more sampled. Like, do you see some scope for improvement there? Do you see some yeah. influence? Of so the, the issue here is, you know, uh, if you say, okay, it's some arbitrary, so all the other distributions are already arbitrary. Yeah. <laughs> and then if you even make this distribution arbitrary, then basically what can you say, right? Yeah, yeah. so that's the problem. Yeah. Um, a question about, um, sorry, one second. Uh, about the skill mix question. Yeah. Um, sorry, I just forgot the question. Okay, uh, sorry. maybe you'll remember later. Okay. okay. Uh, all right, so skill mix evaluation. So let me start by saying, you know, another big motivation for why we wanted a new evaluation. So these days, if you're following AI, you'll know that, you know, they are the big, big models, the headline models, GPT-4 and whatever. But then there's like a whole slew of models, including many from China in the last couple of months. And, you know, they, are, they all score very highly on the leaderboard evaluations. And, um, you know, it's not clear at all what's going on. Like there are these small models that comes out and they claim, Oh, on this task, uh, this, this evaluation, I'm actually better than GPT-4. You know, th those kinds of claims. So it's getting to be a mess, and let me tell you why. So maybe many of you have heard about Goodhart's law, right? Uh, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So the moment you put out an evaluation, then it's out there, and people can game it, and which leads us to this new law I created last night. Uh, Gurad's Law, 2023 version, that when a measure becomes a target with big bucks at stake, it ceases to be a good measure within weeks. <laughs> and that's really been the case. You know, those of you who remember Alpaca Eval, I mean, this LLM people remember, you know, like February it was created to give small models a fighting chance, and, you know, it was interesting. Within months it was like completely uh, not a good measure. I mean, you can see these models, which not, I don't want to single out alpaca about. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the measure, right? It's a good hard show. Um, there are all kinds of other, you know, oh, hugging face evaluations. You go there and you download the top ranking model, and it's unprintable, you know, how, what its language capabilities are. So for many of these, yes? Yes, for example, like if you measure like the number of parameters in the model as a target input, like you apply the model and say it's like a, the number of measures they cease to be a number. The number of parameters cease to be good measures within weeks, or like uh, no, uh, no number of measures is not. A, I mean, you can't. Uh, 
you can't just spend a few bucks and get more more parameters. Oh, okay. Oh. Right. There are only a handful of, if for no other reason than just GPT shortage, uh, GPU shortage. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. So anyway, so that's my rant, and probably people who follow this have this rant too. That. Yeah, there are all these evaluations, and then these leaderboards, and these models, which are supposedly great. And then you try to interact with it in chat form, and it's unprintable. They are very, very poor. Yes? Uh, so the 2023 version of Goodhart doll, if you replace the dollar sign with like, academic measures, like publications, you think it's still, <laughs> it seems like, it's a, like a very nice. Yeah, I, I think it's happening so fast, and it's not because of academics, because almost no academics right now have even the ability to play this game. So most of these models are like little startups. Um, and I don't know who. Quite a few from China lately. Uh, actually, the Chinese models are not bad at all. Uh, they, they, I mean, yeah, they are serious themes. OK, so uh, all right, so, uh, why, so why is this a mess? Good evals for 7 billion models are too easy for GPT-4. Uh, but then because of Goodhart's when they are first introduced. But then, because of Godhart's law, pretty soon 7B models are competing with GPT-4. So there's that. Contamination, you know, evaluation examples. When it's, it's out, out there, you know, companies keep training new models. They can uh, find evaluation examples, and they end up in training data, either by hook or by crook. Uh, cramming for leaderboard, you know, there's probably deliberate training on data, real or synthetic, to improve the rank on leaderboards. And uh, many LLMs with good scores often have poor general capabilities. I single out these two. OK, so <coughs> skill mix evaluation, so it tries to address this. Uh, and it also relates to the theory I showed about combination of skills. So how well is the model able to combine skills that it already knows? Um, all right, so the goal is to be, you know, this ability to combine skills is relevant to general intelligence. Um, and yet it's also easy to administer. Okay, it starts getting to be very uh, close to relevant, uh, intelligence, but still it's easy to administer. Um, it should be resistant to training set contamination. Um, it should have a difficulty dial to avoid saturation effect, and there you can just increase the number of skills you're asking the model to combine. Uh, and it should have a clear path to increasing difficulty or scope in future. For example, you know, we started with a set of 100 skills, but tomorrow you can add a thousand more, you know, what, ask this group, you know, what skills are important for humans, and you can add it. Okay, and it gives some evidence of novelty and of understanding. And the claim is that LLM is not a stochastic pattern, at least in a weak sense, uh, this thing. Okay, so skill mix. So I already indicated, but here it is again. So you start with a set of n skills like these. How do we choose the set? It's about 100 skills. All of these skills are well recognized uh, in terms of uh, language skills, theory of mind, you know, how we understand each other, physical reasoning, logical reasoning. And all of these share one thing. They all have a Wikipedia entry. Yes. Every model today, even little ones, are trained extensively on Wikipedia. It's like the most uh, reliable source of information out there. Uh, so they all know this. And you can test it. They all know these skills. They can define it for you. T topics, these were topics we chose because they are well known enough, but still don't occur too often in normal training corpus. And uh, using randomness, you select K skills and one topic. And then you have this prompt, generate a short text about showing that exhi exhibits these skills. So this is k equals three, three skills and one topic. And then you already saw this, okay? Lama 2, 7b, Lama 2, 70 billion, and GPT-4. Yes? Why is it necessary to have like um, a separate like selection of topics? Why not just ask the LLM to generate a short text that exhibits these skills? But then just the thing the okay, topic. so we'll get to that, yeah, and because of the, uh, the stochastic power. How do you evaluate this? There was another question about this. Uh, so we evaluate by GPT-4, automated. 
Uh, you have to set up that pipeline. You know, the paper describes this. But this is the trend these days anyway. You're using GPT-4 to evaluate. Um, and then we did human spot checking. <coughs> so we spot checked. So uh, just to check that, you know, the, uh, that GPT-4's evaluation is reasonable. And, you know, we did the usual thing here is, you know, GPT-4 is at best an uh, imperfect instrument. So, you know, you have to do some r runs to see, you know, oh, it didn't quite get this. So you clarify the instruction and so on. Yes. So how do you future proof this? Like in, in the future, are you still going to use GPT-4 to evaluate some like more powerful models? Uh, oh, no, no, no. So you would have to, OK. So if in the future uh, the skills get very complicated, I mean, there's a question, right? So the, the skills, ideally, you would want to be such that all the basic models know. So then, spot, like they can spot it as well. And then you would hope that you, know, you just ask them K questions. Is this skill there? Is this skill there? And they say yes. So it seems that checking is simpler than generation. Right? This is the old P versus NP intuition. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it read the paper. There's still some caveats there. Yeah, but in general, you would use the Apex model of its time to do this. Um, and so these were the results. Uh, so there are more, there's more than one version in the paper. Uh, this was the strongest version. And we explained why we think it's stronger. And we didn't come to it initially. We had some version. And then we realized how we could make it stronger. So you, you do this evaluation, and you realize. Uh, and then we made it stronger. And anyway, so this is it. And uh, I guess uh, maybe those of you who are following the field know these, you know, Mistral, QN, et cetera. Uh, it was interesting because, you know, there were claims made how good they are, and they probably are very good. But at least on this, they don't do as well. And the one takeaway here, the red arrow, is that GPT-4 wiped the floor with all the models. So that was actually stronger performance than we expected. Like, we didn't expect the gods to be so large. Yes? So Regarding evaluation, to what degree do you think this result is due to the alignment between GPT-4 being both the generator and the <laughs> Yeah, so we discussed that, yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we also did grading with Llama 70. Uh, and that was actually less reliable. Uh, so this is closer to, and as I said, human spot checking, right? So. We think, you know, you shouldn't trust the second decimal in this too much, but I think the first decimal is probably okay, so. I guess my question is more regarding, if I define the skill, like more exponents, it has a very clear definition. But I'm guessing for some of the, for some of the skills, they can be interpreted in several ways. No, I know, I think this measure. So you're again saying, like, GPT-4's grading may be different from GPT-5's. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, sure, that can never be ruled out. Different. Yes. But that's, uh, no, no, for the same set of skills, I'm saying. No, I'm saying, like, for the same set of skills, it might be different. To that's right. Uh, yeah. So for the same set of skills, GPT-5's grading may be different from GPT-4, and vice versa. So as I said, you know, with human spot checking, you are sort of sure of the first decimal, not the second. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. Uh, what did the dashes represent? Uh, we didn't even test it, because the performance for k equals 3 and 4 was bad enough oh. that, yeah. yeah. It didn't make sense. Uh, yeah? It might have performed better with more skills. No, I seriously don't. <laughs> uh, OK. So all right. Uh, stochastic parrots. So do these things understand us, or are they stochastic parrots? Stochastic parrots refer to their suggestion that basically these language models, you know, they're trained on a ton of data. So when you, at test time, when you're asking them things, they are selecting out pieces of text that they saw in their memory and presenting it to you. And the point here is, uh, which I implicitly made earlier, with you have n skills and t topics, there are n choose k times t possible combinations, right? Set of k skills and t topics. And uh, then, so, so that's a lot, large number of combinations. But right now, n is small, only 100. Ideally, we would do this test with n equals 1,000 or 10,000. You know, there are lots of skills. But 
that you know to do it at, at an academic scale maybe any scheme is very tough to do it like so that there aren't too lots of easy skills and so on so you really need some good filtering here so this this we are reasonably confident that all these skills are roughly about the same difficulty or at least the amount of time they appear in the corpus so is roughly similar so then we had this set of skills and using the small language model uh, we identify skills and topics uh, Sorry, this doesn't parse. So uh, to identify skills and topics that have low probability in standard text corpora. So they have non-zero probability, obviously. You know, they all appear in Wikipedia. But they, uh, the, the, the prevalence is not super high. Okay, Like 1% is, is, is considered upper limit. So, so you estimate that using text corpora. You can just send you know, a million sentences through a Llama 7, and it can tell you the rough, uh, the rough uh, prevalence. Then you do a simple probability calculation based upon estimated frequencies of skills in the corpus, which shows that at least one third of GPT-4 is correct answers for k equals 5 used skill topic combinations that were not in the training corpus. OK, so that's our estimate. So, you gave it new settings, so to speak, which are not in the training corpus. I mean, each skill was there, but not this combination. And it did OK. So we think that this shows that at least the, you know, it's not a stochastic pattern in a weak sense that, you know, this, uh, that it's just completely dependent on the training corpus. It's generalizing a little bit. Uh, yeah. Um, Two minutes? Uh, OK. So let me finish and then take questions. <laughs> So this is another uh, discussion that's been going on on Twitter between the leading lights of the field. Um, so by the way, I showed Hinton uh, this, and he liked you know, this interpretation that, about originality. Um, but anyway, do LLMs contain a world model? You know, again, related to that. Like, do they have a model of the world? And so here was a prompt, you know, give me just two sentences of text about a mother and child shopping in ancient Mesopotamia, and which incorporate these skills. OK, and now the usual. If you're a GPT-4 whisperer, you know that you know you have the first attempt is not the best, and then you tell it to, OK, can you look over your attempt and improve, et cetera, two, two rounds of that. We did that in the evaluation, too, for all the models. And then it gave this. OK, so that's pretty good, yeah. Yeah, Jeff uh, Hinton also thought it was pretty impressive. OK, so concluding thoughts. So we've given an elementary and plausible account of scale emergence. I mean, there's. Not a lot of assumptions, but one or two key assumptions. Uh, it explains phenomena such as learning a k tuple of skills is possible without seeing it in the training data, and this is verified. Uh, how are extensions of our theory? Obviously, there's simplistic elements. The skills are hierarchical, almost certainly. They are non iid combinations, which we haven't uh, um, played with. Uh, uh, we've reduced skills to statistical notions, right? Distributions and distributions of text pieces and so on, which seems limiting. And there's a general question. Is intelligence just a form of statistical learning or is something else? Um, harder versions of skill mix would be interesting for code, visual reasoning, et cetera. Um, we think that automated, auto-graded evaluations with large number of random challenges is the way to do evaluations in the future. Uh, some way to, you know, get over this uh, good hearts law business, hopefully. Uh, and are there ways to create LLMs without human scale and call? I mean, the whole theory was explaining why scale helps, but is it necessary? 